Hey, so in this video, I wanna talk about some of the inspiration behind uh, this circuit here. Uh, this is one of three. Uh, I've only assembled one so far uh, that it operates on the three channels of color information coming out of a component video signal. And the idea here is to test a few different ideas around building an analog color corrector. Um, if you're not familiar with color correction, I wanna go into a little bit of the theory around that, and then we'll dive into the whiteboard for how this schematic works. So I'm gonna start off um, by analogy. The video that you're looking at now is being uploaded to YouTube at 1080p resolution. That means there's 1,920 pixels across and each row or each line, there's uh, 1,080 of them. Um, you've probably heard of 4K video. 4K video is four times the size, four times the number of pixels. So it's 3,840 by 2,160. This camera that I'm recording at right now is a 6K camera. So it is uh, nine times the size of uh, a 1080p video. I'll double check that. But anyway, the thing is with this camera, I can zoom in digitally without losing any information. There's more pixels being captured by this sensor than what I'm uploading to YouTube. So digital zoom is completely lossless to a level. I can zoom in, you know, three or four times and that there's no issue. The other thing about this camera is it's recording in 12 bit video, whereas the video you're watching is eight bits. What that means is each RGB pixel has one of uh, 256 different values. That's two to the power of eight. That's what eight represents in the 8-bit video per pixel or per color. Um, this camera is recording 12 bits. Now the difference between 8 to 12 doesn't sound like a lot, but you have to remember it's binary. So each bit that you add is doubling the, the, the dynamic range, the amount of information each pixel is storing. So it is storing 16 times more information per pixel. Now that's useful because you can zoom into the color. Now what does that mean? Well. This is what this video looks like raw out of the sensor. It looks all kind of gray and washed out um, because this video, the way I've sort of set it up in terms of the aperture and the shutter speed and all of those sort of things, I've got most of the information in the middle. I've left lots of headroom for bright highlights and lots of room for dark. And then I can go to the computer and using a tool, I'll probably overlay it around here somewhere, um, that shows sort of a, a mapping from what the is coming out of the camera to what you're seeing on the screen. So across here, across the bottom, you have the 12 bits uh, coming off the sensor. Then along here, you have the eight bits going out to this video that you're watching. And the straight line along here, what that means is it's basically a one-to-one -one direct mapping. It's basically a linear map, a function f of x is equal to x. Now we wanna maybe bring in some of those blacks so we can drag the blacks over a little bit. So we're gonna lose some of the stuff that's deep in the shadows, but it's gonna make the blacks that you're seeing a little bit richer. Then likewise, the whites, there's a lot of headroom here. We can bring that in as well. And now we're, sort of, we're using the, the full eight bits um, more effectively. Then a common thing that you might wanna do is add some sort of S curves to the shape here and adjust these and that'll give you sort of a, a more softer approach to the highlights and the lowlights. These nonlinear transforms are sort of just scratching the surface of what you can do with color correction. You can operate on each channel individually, you can do keying and windowing and masking and a whole bunch of things, but this idea of adjusting curves gives you some really subtle control over the way an image looks. You can be sort of quite neutral with it or you can be quite artistic with it and there's a whole bunch of things that you could do. And I wanted to capture that in an analog circuit. So to understand how this circuit works, it's, it's probably useful to understand a little bit about how I was thinking about this problem. So let's digitally zoom into the whiteboard and uh, talk about how this guy works. What I'm trying to do with this circuit is to capture the spirit of uh, editing those color curves, not necessarily copy the exact methodology of putting nodes on a graph and sliding them around, that would be tricky to do in the analog domain. And I think the entire point, or at least one of the big reasons I wanted to move this to the analog domain, was to change how you think about editing color curves and to give you a different perspective on um, what you could do and just open up a, a different way of interacting with the underlying mathematical objects because I think uh, it can inspire some creativity, hopefully. So when I was looking at this problem, uh, not problem, but you know, uh, methodology of, of editing color curves. Um, 
I had to think about how I'd take this to the analog domain. So we start off with this graph here of in signal versus out signal. And the straight line is, is what you get uh, by default. And what we did is we sort of you know, pulled the blacks in a little bit over here and pulled the whites in and everything above here got clipped to white. Everything below here got clipped to black. And oh, that line should be straight, but yeah. That was sort of our first thing that we did. And when you look at this, all you're really doing is changing the slope of this line. You're multiplying it by some constant. If this straight line here is f of x is equal to x, this new function here, if we set aside the clipping for a section, is f of x is equal to some beta times x. Now, um, this doesn't capture the clipping. That's sort of handled by hardware. Um, your analog to digital converters will, will clip at some point. You could do clipping in other ways, but you know the basic essence here is rotating the curve around this way using some beta as a multiplier. Now, if you just had the function being like that, it would assume that this distance here is the same as this distance here, namely that you're rotating it around the center of the chart. Now, that may not be the case. You may want to do the blacks differently to the whites. So, if you simply add some alpha, some constant here that could be positive or negative, not only can you rotate, but you can shift left and right. That lets you capture everything from this process of just doing that. Um, so how do you do this in the analog world? Well, you start with an operational amplifier. If you're not familiar with operational amplifiers, they're called operational amplifiers because they are amplifiers that let you do mathematical operations. They have three terminals. They have an output and two inputs, a negative input and a positive input, and they take the difference of them and spit it out over here. Now, a very common configuration that you see for op amps acting as amplifiers is you'll see something in the feedback path going from the output to negative. You very rarely see it going this way because that's very unstable. Um, but this is one of the most basic configurations where you have some input signal here. Let's continue with the theme and call that X. That's a voltage. Now, for our video signals, I've modified them so that they're centered around zero volts. Um, it comes in here, goes through two resistors. We'll call this one R1 and this one R2. And the output here is beta X, where beta is this resistor divided by that resistor. They form, if you look at it, sort of slightly sideways, a voltage divider. And uh, this gets you R2 over R1. Now, you actually get minus R2 over R1 because your signal is coming in to the negative signal. Um, but uh, that's okay. We can put another negative somewhere down the chain and that'll all get worked out. Now, for that to be true, this is typically tied to earth or ground or some zero voltage reference. And that is your basic uh, inverting uh, amplifier. Now, what you can do is you can change this voltage reference. Uh, instead of it being ground, you could put a potentiometer in here or something like that. Some variable resistor between some positive reference voltage and some minus reference voltage. And the ratio that you get here between these two voltages, depending on which position your potentiometer is, gets you your alpha. So you get beta x plus alpha. And that's pretty much exactly what's happening in the first of the three stages that happen here. So there's three op amps here. They're LM7171s, which are 200 megahertz, um, uh, relatively high bandwidth op amps. And we have these first two knobs here, one being offset, one being gain. Offset is your alpha, your gain is beta. So that's what these two little guys do here. In fact, that's what the post stage does as well. The only difference between the pre-stage and the post-stage is the pre-stage is actually a non-inverting amplifier. The post-stage is inverting. Um, not a huge um, reason for that. Uh, well, there are some reasons, but mainly you want to get a, a positive signal out when you could put a positive signal in. So this gets us this part, but that's not enough. Um, we want to add sort of, we want to end up with some a, a machine that lets you make sort of these S curves. And they might be steep in the middle, they might be 
have just little S's and more gradual or, you know, you want to explore a variety of these S-curve shapes with some knobs. And so I stared at this problem and if you just stare at sort of the, the, the top half of this, it looks like you want a device that creates a function which is basically log of x. That kind of looks like a log curve and this kind of looks like an upside down log curve. How do you generate a log curve from analog components? Turns out it's actually relatively easy. Um, this equation is no longer going to be true, so we'll get rid of that guy. You replace this resistor here with dun, 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 a diode. Why would you put a diode in there? How does a diode get you log? Let me tell you how that happens. To understand how this works, you have to understand the characteristic um, voltage versus current relationship of a diode. So let's draw a chart here, which is I for current along here and V for voltage along here. And before we get to a diode, let's start with a resistor. We know that the voltage drop across a resistor, V, is equal to the current flowing through that resistor times the resistance of that resistor, R in ohms. So if you rearrange that equation to match, you know, this being X and Y, you get that I equals one on R times V. So you get a straight line with a slope of one of R, one over R. So that's what an IV curve is, very basic for a resistor. For a diode, if you know things about diodes, you probably know they let current flow in one direction. And they look like an open circuit, um, uh, basically, when that current is flowing. And so the actual curve grows very quickly like that. You could almost say exponentially. And the way this works is there's some sort of on voltage, you can think of it, typically around 0.7 volts. Beyond that, um, current flows like a, a wire. A wire that never burns up would be, be a straight line here. And so a diode gets there very quickly um, like that. Actually, the, the curve also extends in the negative and somewhere down here, what's called the breakdown voltage, it does allow current to flow in the other direction. But typically that breakdown voltage is very large, definitely larger than the realm of the video signals that we're dealing with. So we're not gonna talk about that. Um, Zena diodes have a smaller breakdown voltage, but anyway, not important. So, this gets us a function that is actually approximately e to the power of v, where v is your voltage going across it here. I say approximately for a couple of reasons. There's something called the ideal diode equation, um, and there's a term in there which uh, is temperature dependent. Uh, this curve shifts around with temperature. And also, uh, there's another term which is called the ideality factor of a diode, which represents how ideal the diode is. But you get roughly E of X. That's what you get just with a diode sitting in space, not in a circuit like this. What happens when you do the math on a circuit like this is if this is the line I equals V or Y equals X, any IV curve that you put in here gets flipped around this line here. And you get that as the relationship between this and that, that voltage there and this voltage here. Uh, this becomes log of x, because you're taking the inverse of that function. Um, the math is fun to do. I will skip it around here. So this, assuming, you know, let's ignore this guy here and the value of that resistor, would give you roughly sort of log of x. Now obviously there's something that happens below 0.7, and if our voltages sometimes go negative, the log of a negative number, um, yeah, uh, is not quite right. So let's get to that in a second. Um, actually, let's talk about something else. I don't actually use diodes here. I use transistors. So let's draw in ourselves a little transistor. And we'll make it point that way. Why am I using a transistor here? Two reasons. Firstly, that ideality factor that we talked about, it's actually a lot better uh, for a transistor compared to a diode. 
um, transistors are better diodes uh, when this base of the transistor is tied to ground. Um, they're still temperature dependent, but it gets rid of one of the things that are behind this little approximately equal sign. But the other reason why I'm using transistors here is this base actually becomes another input. And if you put a current into here, the base current coming into here, you can change the shape of this curve. Now, you actually need two transistors in here or two diodes, because remember this signal goes positive and negative. Uh, I'm going to get confused. There we go. There's we have a PNP and an NPN. With also its own base current. And what that lets us do is add some logginess to the curve here and some logginess to the curve here. And the amount of curvature that you get and that cut in threshold is determined by obviously the characteristic of the, the transistor plus whatever current you put in here. Now the other thing that I do is I put, let's, let's redraw this line because it's not very straight. I put variable resistors here and here, which lets me change the amount of current that flows through each of these paths. And I also have a third path, which is just a regular resistor. And this resistor here becomes a potentiometer. So we can change the gain and we can change how much preferentially of the current is going through the, this path versus this path versus this path. Now obviously these two paths depend on the direction of the current, um, but that gives us a whole bunch of control about how much compression we're adding to the blacks versus the whites and sort of the depth of that compression. So we can have a, a little knee up here or a big swoopy knee, depending on how we set these two uh, currents. Now just for completeness, I also put the transistors over here, uh, another one here with its own base current, and another one here with its own base current. And these two on this side let you get that exponential function. So you end up in a world where you have 14 knobs um, as I said, this circuit's a prototype. I'm probably not going to use all 14 knobs in the finished thing because that would be 42 knobs in total for all three channels. But it lets me sort of play with them and see what I like, what I don't like, um, what knobs I think are useful and what knobs aren't useful, and just get a sense of, of uh, how this circuit performs. Now, I haven't talked about this chip here. This is an LM324, a quad audio op amp. And yes, I have four audio inputs for control voltages for also controlling these base currents, so that's cool. Um, this circuit is not finished for some other reasons. Um, these transistors that I'm using down here aren't actually the ones that are designed for this circuit in my SPICE simulation. Um, they're just random PNPs and NPNs that I had. Um, but even if I was using sort of uh, better transistors, you're gonna get ringing um, around these because of parasitic capacitance and capacitance that's happening inside the transistor themselves. You can compensate for that. Um, using uh, RLC circuits. Uh, also transistors also have this temperature dependency as well and you may want to control for that but I don't know how much of a deal that will be in this application. But that's kind of what's going on here. Um, this video is already pretty long so I'm going to be a bit of a tease. Let's put this circuit through its paces in the next video. See you next time.